Hi, everybody. Thanks for coming. I know there's a lot of talks. I really appreciate you guys coming to this one. Uh, my name's Mitch Garnett. I'm Director of uh, Operations at Scopely. And today we're going to be talking about our continuous deployment pipeline that we put together over the last three months. And uh, I don't know if you guys have been to the keynotes, but it's kind of interesting that uh, the, the idea of deployment has come up a lot in the, in the keynotes. Um, on Tuesday, there was the whole uh, new service, the code deploy service that was announced, which is, is really cool. Uh, and today's keynote, uh, in the Docker conversation, there was talk about uh, green-blue deployments, uh, and which is something we're going to be talking about today. So everybody's talking about deployments, including us. So if you haven't heard of Scopely, um, we are a mobile gaming company. So we do iOS and Android games, Facebook games. Um, we get in the wrong slide here. Sorry. Uh, we've got a number of really popular games, uh, and more of them coming all the time. Uh, we've got about 35 million users across all of our games, and on any given day, we're handling billions of requests. Uh, from users of our games. And uh, we are 100% on Amazon Web Services. So, deployment. Um, software deployment is something, I and mean, if you Google it or Google deployment pipelines, um, there's a lot of information on deployment. It's something we, as software developers, talk about a lot. It's kind of a big deal. Uh, it's really what we need to go through, the steps we need to go through to get our software in the hands of our users, really. So it's pretty important. Um, in the old days, deployment was more about you know, building, burning disks and, dis and shipping them around. Now, I'm sure for everybody in this room, deployment means getting some software up on some servers in the web somewhere, probably in Amazon Web Services. So while we talk about deployment a lot, and it's a really big deal for us. The thing is that for customers, um, they don't really think about deployment, and they shouldn't ever have to think about deployment. So from a customer's point of view, if they're sitting there playing one of our mobile games and we deploy some new software, uh, what we want them to see is basically nothing. We want it to be a seamless experience for them. And uh, the only thing they might notice is maybe there'll be a new feature that wasn't there before, or maybe some bug that used to be there is now fixed, but there should be no uh, break in their experience. So that's really important for uh, us as a company to maintain that user experience. So, you know, just to, one more quote, and this one's from me, but something along these lines. If you ever are in a position where you've got to talk to your customers or talk to uh, your management or talk to the business leaders in your company about software deployment, then probably something's gone really wrong because they should never have to know about it. That's the thing for us to worry about. And if it ever kind of breaks out of that world, then something's gone wrong. So the basic uh, topics for today are, uh, I kind of wanted to go over the goals, you know, what we wanted to accomplish with the deployment pipeline that we built talk a little bit about green-blue deployments, which again, we heard a little bit about in the keynote today, and uh, think about sort of a high-level view about of how our actual deployment works and how it differs from traditional green-blue deployment. And then we'll try to dive into a little bit more detail on how our de deployment pipeline actually works. So that's the agenda. So in building this pipeline, which we've sort of done over the past three or four months probably, um, we wanted to have, obviously, a very automatable, repeatable process. We want to be able to, you don't want have to have to be me messing around manually in a deployment process. You, as, as much as possible, want it to be push a button and things happen. Um, another important goal for us was to be compatible with the auto-scaling service. Uh, the deployment approach that we used previous to this pipeline that we put together uh, really was not compatible with auto-scaling. Uh, and because it was sort of based on a model that's much more um, 
uh, much more of a traditional model where you've got a fleet of servers, they're static, and you're kind of constantly updating those servers with new versions of software. But if you want to do auto-scaling, you need to be able to allow the auto-scaling service to create a new instance on your behalf at any time, and it's got to be able to, you have to be able to ensure that the right software is on that new instance each time it fires up. So that didn't really fit into our, uh, our deployment model at all, and so we weren't really benefiting from uh, Auto scaling, and it's a very cyclical business up daily and over the weekend. So there was a lot of uh, cost savings we could incur, uh, gain from from using auto scaling. Um, another major factor was to be able to uh, roll back deployments. So uh, no matter how much you test, no matter what goes, how much effort you put into it, uh, there are times when you deploy software that you really shouldn't have deployed, and you want to have a way to back that software out as quickly as possible with as little impact on your users. Uh, the games that we produce are uh, very social games. So there are a lot of interactions with friends. There's a lot of uh, interactions with our servers. So any di disruption in, in our servers while a, a, a player is playing the game is going to be very disruptive. And they're probably going to get fed up, stop playing the game, and that's the last thing we want to have happen. We want them to keep playing our games. So in sort of researching uh, what we wanted to do and how we wanted to redo our pipeline. Uh, one thing that we read about and, and studied was this idea of a blue-green deployment. And it seemed like it was a model that fit into a lot of our requirements. So I don't know how many people are familiar, but I thought I'd just kind of walk through sort of what a blue-green deployment actually is. Um, in a blue-green deployment, the, you have two identical clusters of servers. So one is always hot, serving production traffic, and that's called the blue cluster. So your blue cluster is always live, always serving traffic, and basically all your customers are hitting that particular cluster. You have another cluster called the green cluster, which is just sitting idle in this period of time. So it's just sitting there waiting for you to use it. When you want to deploy software, you would basically install the new software on all the instances within your green cluster uh, through whatever mechanism you want to use. But now the green cluster has all your new software on it. The next step in a blue green deployment is that you would run a very thorough acceptance test on the software that you've just installed in the green cluster. So meanwhile, your blue cluster is still serving your customers, the old version of your software, but you're running this acceptance test against the green cluster to kind of convince yourself that the code that you've deployed into that green cluster is ready to go. And then the final, the next step would be to basically switch production traffic from the blue cluster to the green cluster. And that switch is usually done uh, instantaneous or, or as quickly as possible all at once. So in a traditional data center, you, you know, you'd some sort of uh, a router or switch or something, but that switch is made all at once. So you know, one moment in time, everybody's using the old software, and essentially the next moment in time, everybody's using the new software. And then the final step is you sort of turn the green cluster, um, at least logically, into the blue cluster. It's now the production cluster, and the other cluster, which was previously blue, uh, is now green and available for deployment of your next version and testing. So that's sort of how a blue-green deployment works. Uh, Classically, anyway. Uh, in, in thinking through that and how that fit in with Scopely and our workflow and our, uh, I'm just sort of reiterating what a blue-green deployment is here, two identical clusters, full acceptance test on the candidate, switch traffic all at once. So those are the kind of primary uh, factors in a blue-green deployment. In thinking through that and how it applied to what we do and the way that we work, uh, there were a couple of issues that we had uh, in thinking through this. Uh, one is that it's expensive, although that's much less of an issue these days with Amazon. Obviously, you can, these, those servers don't have to sit there all the time, but there is a significant amount of time when you've got two full clusters where there are lots of things happening with them. So there's some additional expense there, which is one, one factor. Um, another really critical part of blue-green deployment is that the acceptance tests are crucial. So you have to be really confident the acceptance tests that you have and are, are able to run against your new software is going to tell you whether there's a problem or not. 
Uh, not everybody is in a position where they have tests that are that thorough, that they have that much confidence in. Um, the third thing, really, is that you know, if you were running this in a data center, there's some really easy ways to switch that traffic that would have no impact on your customers at all. It happens completely within your own data center. Uh, no DNS changes, nothing has to happen. But when you're working in the cloud, uh, you don't really have that option. So there's basically the normal way that you would accomplish blue-green deployment in something like Amazon is you would have two separate elastic load balancer groups. You know, one represents the blue group, one represents the green group. And you would, when, you, when it's time to switch, you would basically do some sort of a DNS change to change the CNAME record that points to your blue group over to point to the green group. And that would be the way that you would try to direct people over to the new version of your software. Um, the issue with that that we found in doing some testing and kind of doing some research is that DNS clients really don't behave themselves well. So if you made a DNS change, and let's say you had a really short TTL on, on your record, so you said that the TTL on this DNS record is 15 seconds. What's that, what that's supposed to mean is that any DNS client who is looking up that record should know and be careful about checking with the DNS server every 15 seconds to see if there's a new value or not. Has it changed? Has it changed? What happens in practice, though, is that a lot of DNS uh, clients just ignore that. So they, they basically don't check. So you can, make, you can change the record. You can tell DNS that it should be pointed here. But if the client never actually goes and checks again, it's still going to be sending requests to the old, to the old endpoint. And that's not going to be good. Um, the other issue is that, as I said, you normally have two elastic load balancers in that scenario. One, your blue one, is all warmed up. It's ready to go. It's been handling hundreds of thousands of requests a minute for you know, hours or days. And then you've got this other one that you just created for this purpose. And you've put some servers in it, uh, and you make the switch. But the problem with that approach is that uh, it's called elastic for a reason. It's an elastic load balancer that grows and shrinks based on the amount of traffic that it's getting. So if it's a brand new one, they don't create a brand new one this big. They create a brand new one this big and let it scale up to the size to meet your traffic. So if you immediately switched over to that, that other elastic load balancer group, uh, other elastic load balancer, the new one, uh, and then tried to throw hundreds of thousands of requests per minute at that particular server or ELB, uh, you'd be getting a lot of errors. So it'd be a very unpleasant experience for your customers and, and for you. So uh, there's ways around that. You can warm it up ahead of time. You can, uh, if you have the right service contract with Amazon, you can actually call them or, or create a ticket and have them warm it up for you. But all those things are just more moving pieces, more complexity in the process. So what we decided to do was sort of merge those a little bit and kind of a mixture of green and blue. Uh, we kind of call it cyan. I think I've heard somebody call it purple before. It depends on whether you like additive color or subtractive, I guess. But it's a kind of a, a blending of these that fits our purposes really well. So some of the differences are that it has qualities of a canary release, if you've ever heard of a canary release, which is the idea of sort of dipping your toe in, trying out your new software on a small subset of the production traffic before you actually expand it out to a bigger audience. Um, it sort of acknowledges implicitly that your acceptance tests are incomplete. So we've got a pretty good set of tests. We've got unit tests. We've got integration tests. But we didn't have a set of tests that we were comfortable with saying, if it passes these tests, turn everybody live onto this new set of software right now. So we wanted to have a more gradual way of doing that. Um, another really nice benefit of this approach is that there's only a single ELB involved in this. So we never have to create another ELB. We don't have to warm it up. We don't have to worry about it not being ready to accept the traffic that we're throwing at it because it's the same ELB that we were just using before. And there's no DNS changes. So again, that, the DNS stuff should work. And a lot, maybe some of you have found it to work, but we've had a lot of issues trying to do these kinds of switches through DNS changes. So in general, there's just a lot fewer moving pieces. 
and it allows us to sort of gradually figure out whether our software is ready to be deployed or not, and it gives us a, still gives us an easy way to back out. So that's kind of the basic idea behind the, this approach. And what I'd like to do is just walk through this at a high level, show you each of the steps in the deployment pipeline, and then we can kind of dig into each of those steps in a little bit more detail. And hopefully at the end we'll have enough time to talk about monitoring as well, which is a, another big piece of deployment. So this is our starting state, this is our steady state. Uh, we've got production traffic hitting a load balancer, an auto scaling group that's been, that's our blue group, and in fact we actually label it or tag it in EC2 as blue. Uh, with some number of instances in it that are appropriate for the amount of traffic we're getting right now. So the first sort of step in this pipeline really doesn't have anything to do with deploying software to production because we really want to have a continuous pipeline that moves us all the way from development all the way through to production. So the first step is what we call preview. And the purpose of preview is to allow us to test every change that we make in our software as we are making it. So the, this particular step is initiated by a check-in into the, to the develop branch of our GitHub repository. So some developer has committed some new code into the develop branch, and that kicks off this whole process. The process uh, continues by basically building artifacts that represent the difference between the last known state we had of the software and the changes that we made. And those deltas, those uh, build artifacts, are pushed up to an S3 bucket. Uh, the next step is we spin up a, a preview instance uh, based on sort of the last snapshot of, the, of, the, of, the, uh, of our software that we've, that we've snapshotted. We bring up a new instance that, our, that is our preview instance. And then the step four, we, employ, we deploy those deltas onto that new preview instance. And at that point, we have a, a single instance. This is not running in production. This is running in a dev environment that has the new software, and we can run tests against it. And that all happens automated, uh, as we'll see in a little bit uh, as we go further through the talk. So that's step one, preview. OK, the next step is what we call bake. And the point of bake is to create the actual build artifact that we're going to deploy in the auto scaling group. So this particular step is triggered by a merge from our develop branch to our master branch. So when we merge from develop to master, that basically means we're making a release. And I think a lot of people sort of run their GitHub repos that way. So that means it's a, it's a build, it's a release. We build that software, we test it. And then the final step of the process is we actually create an AMI based on that software. So we create an Amazon machine image that has all the, all the latest software and everything we need ready to go, baked as an AMI. So that's the bake step. And again, we'll get into all these in a little bit more detail as we go. Uh, a little bit of an aside about the builds. You know, generally you run into two different approaches with this build process. Uh, the one I've just described, which is the one that we use, uh, is sometimes referred to as a golden AMI approach, but the idea is that you, the output of your build process is an AMI. It's an image, machine image that has everything on it, all ready to go, nothing else is required. Um, the other approach would be to have a base image that has a lot of your common software installed, but the things that don't change very often, that you'd start that up as, as your instance, and then there would be some process that would have to deploy your latest version of the software onto that instance before you actually turn it on in your auto-scaling group or in your ELB. So two different ways of doing it. Both of them can work uh, and have been shown to work. We've basically taken this golden AMI approach because it, it, um, we like the fact that all of our dependencies are resolved at build time. So if there's any issue with uh, some repo not being available or Anything at all, that's all gonna happen when we're building, not when we're deploying. Uh, we get, end up with an Amazon machine image that has everything we need, it's all ready to go. Uh, it's also faster at start time because there's no deployment process happening right then. Um, we actually use Windows instances for a lot of our gaming servers, not all of them. Um, Windows servers take quite a bit longer to start anyway, so anything you can do to shorten that time is, uh, is, is good. <clears throat> 
And this also fits in with our release cadence. So uh, we don't do like many releases a day. We do probably several releases a week for a, a game at the most. So you know, the process of baking an AMI and building it into, you know, that, that can take a little bit of time, but in the cadence of releases that we have, it works out fine. It's, if you were trying to do you know, a release every single change, you know, every 10 minutes or every 15 minutes, this may not work out for you. So after we bake the AMI, the next step in the release process would be staging. And what happens in staging is we actually create uh, another auto-scaling group and associate it or attach it to the same ELB that we're using for production. So sometimes, you know, when people hear that, it sounds like it would be exactly the thing you wouldn't want to do. Doesn't that screw up the, the instances that are already running in, your, in the other auto-scaling group in your ELB? And the answer is it really doesn't. In fact, they're sort of designed to work this way. Um, all the instances in our ELB that are running in production currently, before we start staging, are all controlled by a single auto-scaling group. We're creating a whole other auto-scaling group and creating instances in there. It doesn't have any knowledge of the other instances that are being managed by the other auto-scaling group. So it's not gonna attempt to scale them up or scale them down or do anything with them. It just basically ignores them. It doesn't know a thing about them, which is exactly what we want, really. So we create another auto-scaling group uh, we create one or a couple of instances within it, a small number, and that's the, the staging process. So once we've staged it, we monitor that staged instance very carefully. So now we're actually sending production traffic to uh, this one or two small instances that we have within the, the green group. So we want to really monitor those carefully, make sure things are going okay. If there's any pro kind of a problem, we would wanna figure out what to do about it. If everything goes smoothly, though, at that point, the next step would be to scale it up. So basically, we need to adjust the auto-scaling group to bring up as many instances, that, instances as we need to uh, handle the traffic currently in the, auto, in the ELB. So that's the scaling group, scaling step. And then the final step in a successful deployment would be the switch. So basically, we switch all the traffic. We, we kind of get rid of the blue group. The green group is still there. It's still in the ELB, and it just starts handling all the traffic. There's no instances there running the old software anymore. So now, at this point, we've switched over, and all customers are hitting the new software. If we did run into a problem anywhere in that process, we would need to basically get rid of the green group that we had brought up and just leave the blue group as it is. So that's our, that's our rollback process. And then in the ending state, we basically relabel the green group to be the blue group, and we're good to go. So that's kind of the high-level view of it. And what I'd like to do now is just step through each of those and give you a little bit more detail of what's actually happening behind the scenes, and also, talk a little bit about the tools that we've been building to sort of help us with this process. So just to review the deployment steps, our preview, bake, stage, scale, rollback, switch. Those are the steps of our process. So in preview, as I said, this is triggered by a commit to our develop branch. The whole process is orchestrated by Jenkins. We create a single instance. We provision it using Ansible. And in the white box there, you can see the actual command that we run that actually does this for us. Uh, it's using a command called fleet. This is not to be confused with the core OS fleet. This is a tool that we've written that I'll talk about a little bit more in a minute. Uh, but the, the whole preview step it can be done with a single command, basically. Um, a little bit of an aside about Ansible. So why do we pick Ansible for this process? Uh, one is that it's Python-based, and we're a Python shop, on, at least on the DevOps side of things. So it's something that's easy for us to extend. It's easy for us to understand. Uh, it's also an agentless uh, deployment technology, so we don't have to have any kind of an agent installed on our servers, which is kind of e makes it easier to manage. There's no central server either. Um, and because our deployment <clears throat> really happens at build time, 
It's a very simple process. We're really just deploying the software to a single instance that we will then bake into an AMI. So it's, uh, we don't really have any issues. Sometimes people, uh, if you've got thousands of instances or something, using an agentless uh, deployment strategy, a push kind of strategy can be, uh, can, can be a little bit onerous, but in our case, it works out just fine. So we've been really happy with Ansible. And then the, command, the, the tool that I mentioned there, the fleet commander, um, is basically a utility that we've written. It's a Python command line tool, sort of built on top of Bodo and some other tools. Uh, and it allows us to do things with individual EC2 instances, which is what we're doing in this case for preview. Um, it allows us to also manipulate auto-scaling groups and uh, just gener generic AWS CloudFormation stacks that we want to be able to manipulate. So it's just a tool that we've built on top of an, uh, an existing base of tools that sort of tailors this process a little bit closer to the way that we think about our deployment. This is, um, of course, there's a config file for everything. This is our, the YAML config file, uh, an example of a YAML config, fi config file for a fleet commander. Uh, it has the kind of stuff you would sort of think about of the ELBs that we're dealing with. Is, that would be the name of the ELB. Do a lot of stuff with New Relic, which I'll talk about a bit later. Uh, so there's some New Relic stuff happening in this config file. It has a lot of properties associated with things like the instance and the auto-scaling groups. Those properties are, uh, we'll see in a minute, basically get mapped to uh, parameters within a CloudFormation template. And it allows us to do things across multiple accounts if we need to. So that's sort of the information that you see within YAML config file. Um, we also use CloudFormation a lot, so this would, for example, be a CloudFormation template that allows us to create that new auto-scaling group. And really, I'm not going to go through it in detail, but the thing I would say is that these parameters, or these CloudFormation templates are heavily parameterized. We try to make them as flexible as possible. And then the, really one of the main jobs of the fleet tool that we are talking about here is to take the parameters from that YAML config file and basically map them to the parameters in the CloudFormation template. So we get to be, makes it really easy to reuse these heavily parameterized CloudFormation templates in lots of different ways with the actual configuration sort of being uh, maintained within a YAML config, excuse me, a YAML config file. So it works out well for us. Okay, for the next step, the bake. Uh, again, it's triggered by a merge to master. More Jenkins stuff to sort of drive the whole thing. We create an instance, we provision it using Ansible, we create an AMI. And that whole process is, is accomplished with a single command, AMI baking bake. So AMI baking is another tool that we've developed. Another Python CLI tool. It's kind of like a really simplified hybrid between Vagrant and Packer. Um, we don't really need to do anything other than AWS. That's the only thing that we deal with. We don't deal with other VMs or other systems. Um, it also, we also only need to deal with Ansible. We don't deal with Chef or Puppet or any of the other config management tools. So we sort of stripped this down to work exactly the way we want it to work. And the other thing that we wanted to do is to be able to have it work with Windows and Linux boxes. Um, since a lot of our game servers are Windows machines, uh, we wanted to be able to treat those like Linux boxes. As a Linux person, I wanted to be able to do that uh, as much as possible. So we basically, in our base images, we install SIGWIN. We have SSH enabled. So Ansible uh, works by SSHing into instances and running commands, and that all sort of works pretty well uh, across Linux and uh, Windows for us. And just to give you an idea of the kinds of things that AMI Baking does, again, there's a YAML file associated with it that drives it. That YAML file would, be, uh, would vary from project to project. Uh, it has basic commands like creating, uh, provisioning, which is uh, installing software on the instance. You can SSH into the instance, that, which is useful during de debug times, just to check to see what's going on with it. Um, once you're, con you're happy with it, you can actually create an image, which will go off and create the AMI. Um, or you can just basically do all of those steps to get combined in, with a single AMI baking bake, drives the whole thing. And here's the YAML config file for AMI baking. Again, you can see the sort of the information about the, um, 
the instance that we're going to create, information about how we SSH into it. Again, we have information about all the accounts we want to use. So if you have multiple accounts, this would basically build the AMI in each of those accounts, and it would be the same AMI across all of those accounts. Um, and we also reference the, the actual Ansible playbook, um, the base image that we're going to use to start with, and this notion of flavors, which really is just another kind of tagging capability that allows us to treat a bunch of instance or a bunch of AMIs as sort of similar, and we can search for them based on the flavor. Okay, so that was Bake. In staging, basically we want to create a new uh, auto scaling group, launch, create a new launch configuration using that newly baked AMI that we just created. Use uh, we use a, a CloudFormation template, which we saw a couple steps back, uh, and we control the min and max size of the auto-scaling group, usually just to be one, so we get a single new instance. And then we label that, tag it, uh, as our green auto-scaling group. And that whole process is created, is done with that single uh, fleet command, uh, fleet, auto-scaling group, create. Uh, you can pass in the number of instances you want, which is just a, done as an environment variable within Jenkins, and that will take care of all those steps. In the scaling process, we want to basically uh, start to increase the number of instances within the auto scaling group. So we need to adjust the min size and max size uh, and the desired capacity of our green auto scaling group. And we do that by update, basically doing a CloudFormation update on the auto scaling group that we just created on the stack associated with it. And uh, an optional command that you see here is that uh, we optionally allow a certain number of failed instances on this particular step. So if you were only deploying or scaling up to two, three or four instances, if there was a problem with any one of those, you would probably want to know it and stop the deployment. That would be you know, a sign that something wasn't going right. But if you're deploying 50 or 60 or 100 servers uh, within a cluster and one of them just doesn't sort of start up properly, uh, you probably want to continue on because that one will eventually just fail health check and be replaced by the auto scaling group. So we allow a certain number or at least have the ability to allow a certain number of failed instances uh, at this step so that we can uh, continue on in our deployment. Rollback at that point is really a simple step of just deleting the green group. So we've put the a bunch of instances, some number of instances into the green group. We're monitoring it, doesn't look right. All we really want to do is just make it go away and have our blue group there handling traffic. So that's done with a single command, just fleet, uh, ASG destroy, green. And then the switch part is um, a couple of steps involved in that. We want to delete the blue stack so the blue stack is the one running our old software. We're happy with the new software. We're ready to get rid of it. So we want to delete that group. We want to use CloudFormation uh, update to relabel the green group to be the blue group. And then we also, as I mentioned earlier, we use New Relic. So we also want to record that deployment in New Relic so that when we're looking in New Relic, we can see it as an event. And if there's something going on, we, we know that and it's related to that deployment, we would be able to correlate it with the deployment that we just made. And that actually requires a couple different fleet commands. We're going to destroy the blue group, update the green group, uh, and then record the new relic, record the deployment in new relic. And again, fleet sort of handles all those details for us. Right, so that's, oh, sorry. That's the, <laughs> that's the, uh, the process, we uh, again, a variation of blue-green deployment, kind of a canary launch uh, aspect. We control the blue and green groups as separate uh, auto-scaling groups. We've got a single load balancer, so there's no DNS changes, no pre-warming of the new ELB. Um, staging provides our final acceptance test, so we can run a bunch of tests beforehand, but we don't really switch until uh, we are convinced in the staging step that the new instance is behaving properly. And throughout the process, uh, this monitoring uh, is really critical to the whole process. So even though monitoring is not really part of the deployment pipeline, it is a, com you know, a critical component that we use in determining whether the deployment is happening properly or not. And so uh, I wanted to spend a little bit of time just talking about where we ended up uh, with on monitoring. 
So again, we use monitoring to figure out, is the preview doing OK? So as we're testing each develop, each uh, commit and develop, uh, did that last build break something, or are we still OK? Um, we need monitoring to help us figure out whether the staged instance is behaving properly. Uh, and for that monitoring, we use a, kind of a combination of things. We use New Relic for sort of app level monitoring. And we use another key component in kind of figuring out whether things are going on, going the right way or not, is looking at the logs. And we've tried lots of different log uh, products, um, commercial ones and, and different types of things. And what we've landed on for handling our logs is uh, Elasticsearch. Um, so we found you know, there's lots of features that logging products provide, but the most critical features for us in using it in a deployment context especially is we want to be able to see the log message in our dashboard as early as we possibly can. So we want that time to visibility is really important. And the other thing we want to be able to do is search for uh, similar logs, or similar errors within the log. So if we get see an error, we want to know is that an isolated one or are there 10,000 of those out there and we need to do something about it. And for those purposes, we found uh, Elasticsearch pr the best approach, the best solution, and gives us the best time to visibility uh, by far. This is sort of our monitoring um, configuration which is a little bit different than some people might use. One thing you notice is there's a Kinesis stream sitting you know, right in the middle of this thing. I'll talk a little bit more about why we do that. But the idea that we have with uh, monitoring is really to get everything that we want to log, all log data, uh, stats, metrics, everything, we push it into the Kinesis stream as quickly as we can. So these UDP sync uh, instances or processes here are little Python uh, applications that uh, they're running Python 3.4 in the new async library. Um, they listen on a UDP port, and the only thing that they do is take whatever you send it, wrap it up in a JSON bundle, ship it into Kinesis Stream. That's it. They don't do any processing, nothing else other than get it into Kinesis as quickly as we possibly can. On the other side of the Kinesis, we have uh, something that looks you know, pretty familiar for anybody uh, familiar with that elastic search. We've got uh, a cluster with three different uh, auto scaling groups for one for storage, one for masters, and one for Kibana, which are all the sort of the components you would need in Elasticsearch. Uh, the other auto scaling group there is for something called Connector, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. So we've sort of gone over this, but you know, we've got these Connector auto scaling groups, Kibana, master storage. Uh, one thing I thought I'd mention is we actually are using M3 medium types for our instance types. So we found um, with, which is actually a pretty small, you know, sort of moderate sized instance type, we found that it's, without Elasticsearch, it's much better to have a, a larger number of small instances than to have a smaller number of really big instances. So, uh, so far the M3 medium types uh, work out well for us. They don't really have much storage on them. So for the storage nodes, we basically created a 200 gigabyte um, solid state e EBS volume that we attach to each of the storage nodes. Uh, and that gives us plenty of storage. We really are cycling those logs on a weekly basis, so we don't really keep logs beyond a week, at least not right now. We might change that in the future. And then the connector app that I talked about is really uh, a Python, it's another Python application. Uh, it's, a, it's an application whose job it is to read from a Kinesis stream. Uh, it ships the log data to Elasticsearch clusters, and then it provides some simple alerting uh, along the way. So with Connector, we're able to say, if you see this particular error show up uh, this many times within this period of time, then, that, then basically raise an alarm, which would mean uh, sending an alert to an SNS topic. Um, it also saves all the state that it needs to sort of remember where it is in the Kinesis stream, uh, saves all that state back to Elasticsearch as well. So this is just a sort of a picture, anybody familiar with the last, it's just a basic Kibana dashboard, but it uh, sort of gives us a really good view of what's going on. We can see the errors, we can drill into any of the errors that we do see. Um, 
So we've been really happy with Elasticsearch. We see really, really quick time between the time the log actually is, is generated and the time we can actually see it and search on it uh, within the Kibana dashboard. And really the final thing I kind of wanted to talk about a little bit was, was you know, why, I mean, that picture looks per probably a lot, looks familiar to a lot of people, but why would you put Kinesis in the middle of it? Why not just go right from your UDP collectors, you know, right into Elasticsearch? Um, and the reason that we do that really is that we, um, we kind of view Kinesis as this really highly available, highly scalable 24 hour buffer that we can write into. So data that you write into Kinesis, into a Kinesis stream will be, is guaranteed to be held within that stream and available for a 24 hour period. So from an operations point of view, that gives us a lot of flexibility. So the, really the strategy is to kind of keep the, the left side of that picture, uh, you know, that what happens on the left side of the Kinesis stream as simple as you can possibly make it. So that's why we have these UDP collectors that do nothing other than to push data directly into Kinesis. So there's no processing, very few things that could possibly go wrong, and we get the data into the Kinesis stream as early as we possibly can. Um, that then gives us a lot of flexibility on the ops side, on the other side, because if we have uh, some sort of an issue with connectors or with Elasticsearch or these much more complicated systems on the sort of the right side of the Kinesis stream, uh, we can be assured that we basically have a 24-hour window to kind of get those things sorted out and not lose any log data. So uh, I think, you know, Kinesis is sort of thought of more as a sort of real-time analytics kind of a thing, a lot of uh, sort of big data, but and it's great for all that, but I find that from an operation point of view, it's just a really great tool to use to sort of give yourself a little bit of slack on the operation side to make sure that you don't lose data, especially critical data like logs or stats metrics, things like that. And so we really uh, are taking this approach both with logs, we're starting to put all of our stats metrics through in the same way. We have UDP um, uh, listeners that just take the data and put it directly into Kinesis as quickly as possible, no aggregation happening, no processing of any kind, and then do all the heavy lifting sort of on the other side of the Kinesis stream. And that's uh, worked out really well, so it's something you might want to consider uh, in your own operations. So just to kind of wrap things up a little bit, um, talked about some of this in the first slide, but we've got roughly 35 million users uh, using our games, you know, active users. We're handling billions of requests a day, which is a decent scale. It's not sort of Netflix, but it's interesting uh, and something um, and, and challenging. Uh, our game clusters generally tend to be between 10 and 50 uh, C3-4X larges uh, you know, per game. So quite a few instances, but again, not, not Netflix scale, but, but enough to be a challenge. Uh, we kind of, uh, in terms of cadences, we do sort of many previews a day. That's happening every time we're committing into the develop branch. We do multiple releases per week, per game. Um, in, from an operations side, we've got about 50 million, doc 50 million documents in our Elasticsearch cluster, you know, and that's rotating them once a week. Uh, and that cluster is handling thousands of requests a second, even with the M3 medium instances. And we really, our ops team really is two people, me and one other guy. Um, you know, the one caveat I would say is we also have a development group that is very sort of DevOps oriented. So we really take the, the DevOps idea very seriously. Our developers uh, are contributing and helping with the ops side uh, of our, uh, of in Scopely, they're writing code that helps with ops and they're hope, you know, actually writing tools. Some of these tools were written by the development team as well. So we're certainly augmented by the engineering team, but from an ops point of view, we have a very small team, I think doing quite a bit of work. Uh, the deployment pipeline has been working out really well for us, so there's lots of ways to deploy code, but this one is working well for us. Uh, we probably will circle around and look at the, uh, the code deploy tool from Amazon. We were involved with the private beta of that, but it didn't support coming from, from Amazon internal, there are no Windows servers inside of Amazon you know, in a production setting. So it had no support for Windows uh, when they released the product, uh, announced it yesterday, it, it does now. So we'll look at that, and I think it has a lot of nice qualities, and certainly the underlying tool of Apollo is, is, a, is a great tool. 
uh, as anybody who's worked at Amazon can, can testify. Um, that's pretty much it. Um, I thank all of you for coming. It's a long way upstairs and off to the corner. Thanks. <laughs>